How many ever drive S SUVs? Um, we have two of them. Before there were SUVs, and they're still sticking around, but before that, minivans. Right? Anybody got minivans? Uh, we got our first minivan when our children were just shamed by the fact that we would actually be driving one. <laughs> that was when they wanted us to drop them off at school, back away from the door. For one thing, Dad was taking them to school. That was humiliating enough. But to arrive in a minivan, that was just too much. But before that, station wagons. Um, see, station wagons was my era of growing up. And, and my family, some of the younger folks here don't even know what a station wagon is. Think this, a pickup truck smushed down. And when you hit it hard enough, it spreads out. So it's, it's kind of a long, big tank of a thing. And it does have three seats, but the back seat, you, you, it faces backwards, right? And you gotta climb in over the, the tailgate you, you can't access it from the doors. You go in from the tailgate and you sit facing backwards. That was my place. I loved it. I thought it was great. But I also think that it may account for why I've always enjoyed history. Because I grew up looking where we'd been instead of where we were going. So for the last, well, last Sunday and this Sunday, we're talking about the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews... Think of this as sitting in the station wagon, looking out the rear view mirror, or the rear, the, well, the rear window, at what has gone before. In this book of Hebrews, the preacher, because that's a better way to describe the person who wrote it, because it's a, sing, it's a sermon. Did y'all do your homework? Mm -hmm. yeah. Trust God? Okay. And I'd also ask you to read through the whole book of Hebrews at one sitting. Did you do that? You know, I used to teach school. And whenever I would ask the students in my class, have you done your homework? I got from them the same look I'm getting from you right now. <laughs> uh, we, we, we had homework? What? Well, okay. Because you, well, we won't have a test just yet, but maybe at the end. Hebrews is a looking back all the way to our ancestors, Abraham and Sarah. Remember? We talked about them last week. Abraham and Sarah, long time ago. And from that period up until the time that Hebrews was written, this preacher is talking about what has happened in the past. Listen, if you see what God has done in the past. If you see what God has done, it gives us a clearer vision of what God is doing. And if we get a clear vision of what God is doing, we can get excited about what God will do. That's, that's what Hebrews wants for us. This sermon on, in Hebrews is looking back at what God has done so that the people who were living at that time will see what God is doing, and then they can have a vision, an excitement about what God will do. Same thing for us. We can just look farther back, because we've had all these years have passed, but the letter, the, well, the, the book is still written to us. So we're going to spend a little time this morning seeing what the preacher in Hebrews has to say to the people who were gathered at St. Mark Church in this particular worship service at this particular time. Keeping in mind, what have we seen God do before? What do we believe God is doing now? And what kind of excitement do we have about what God will do down the road? The way to begin that is to look at chapter 11 at verse 29. We're going to go into the scripture. But first, let me remind you about the definition that the preacher gave us last week. The definition of faith? Do you remember what that was? Of course you do. It, it, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Another way of saying that is, faith is believing, trusting 
that God will do what God promises that God will do. Are you with me? God will do what God promises that God will do. That's the definition of faith, or a better word, trust. Trusting that God will do what God says that God will do. Well, since we know that, we're going to look at what God did. And we're going to begin at verse 29. So the preacher's saying, okay, let's remember. What has God done in the past? Beginning at verse uh, uh, 29 of chapter 11, and you're going to notice the first two words. They keep getting repeated all the way through chapter 11. If you want to go back and, and read it, those two words, by faith, by faith, by faith. That's because the sermon is about faith. By faith, the people pass through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. Does everybody know that story? I mean, well, do you? Okay. If you don't, you're going to have to ask some people around you because we don't have time for that. We, we, but, um, you know, they, they were coming out of Egypt. They got to the Red Sea. They couldn't get across. So uh, Moses, with God's provision, separated the waters and they walked across on dry land by faith. But when the Egyptians followed, uh, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. Jericho is, you know, Joshua. Remember that? Remember that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. God, oh, wait. Uh, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho just by walking around and around and around and around. The walls fell down and the city was delivered. Um, by faith, Rahab the prostitute. Okay, now he's getting. Why is he bringing a prostitute into all of this? By faith, the prostitute, Rahab, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. That's still about Jericho, and Rahab was living there, and Rahab was a prostitute, and, and the spies that were sent into Jericho to scout out the city, you know, y'all with me? Yeah. They, um, she hid them. You know, it seems to me that if God can use a prostitute to do... God's will. <coughs> Me and you are pretty safe, right? If God can do that with her, and no, have you read the genealogy? I know you did this. You went back to Matthew and you read the genealogy of Jesus because you really love reading that begat stuff, right? You have to go count them, but I think, and I hadn't bothered to count, but I think Rahab is the great, 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 great grandmother of who? Jesus. Isn't it amazing? God will do things because God promises. God says, I will do what I promise to do. Even with someone like they have. That gives me hope. I may not have a thing to do with you. Um, but then the preacher, noticing that everybody in that congregation is getting restless, like I'm looking at you fit folks and you're thinking, where in the world is this guy going? Um, he says, and what more could, should I say? For time would fail me. Like, we'd be here all afternoon, he's saying, if I were to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David and Samuel and all the prophets. But he's wanting us to remember all of those folks. Sounds like a, an honor roll of people of the Old Testament. He says, who through faith, listen to what they did, their victories, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions. Does that remind anybody of a story in the Old Testament? Who? Daniel and the lion's den. Anyway, See, that's why I say Hebrews is the hardest book in the New Testament to understand because you've got to know so much about the Old Testament to get it. Anyway, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Remember the, widow, uh, the widows who Elijah raised the the son of the widow back to life. That's, that's what that refers to. All this sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But these people are blessed. They got so many blessings and he just kind of 
echoes that, blessing after blessing after blessing. The problem becomes when we are blessed, we begin to think we're blessed because we deserve it, because we've earned it. It's our just due for living righteously. And then when we think that we deserve our blessing, then the blessing becomes something we did, not something that was gifted to us from God. So we begin to say, as Paul once said, don't think more of yourself than you ought to. We begin to get self-satisfied and self-sufficient and think we can handle it. And we're good because we have so many victories. But because the preacher of Hebrews does not want us to get into that mindset, he says, but wait a minute. Some other stuff happened besides all those victories. And in verse 35, beginning midway through, he says, others were tortured, refusing to escape, to accept release. That is, they would not abandon their trust in God, even in the middle of torture. And they did so in order to obtain a better resurrection. That word better, we're going to come back to in a minute. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented. That does not sound like blessed to me. Just that image of sawn in two. And we're not talking David Copperfield and sawing in the middle and it's a trick. From head down, half. As a way of saying to others, don't follow after them because this will happen to you. But by faith, because they trusted that God would do what God said God would do, they trusted even in their hour of greatest despair and darkness. Now that's the message, I think, that the preacher of Hebrews wants us to hear. In our victories... And in the darkest moments of despair, persecution, defeat, struggle, we by faith trust that God will do what God has promised to do. We heard the promise last week. The promise was this. I am building a city for you. A city of God for you. That's the destiny. The city of God is that relationship that you have with God. It is that intimate relationship. It doesn't have to be a physical place. It's an intimate relationship that begins right now as you by faith begin to walk the way of Christ Jesus. If you do that by faith, I have a city out here for you. This city of blessing. This city that is better than anything you can imagine. That word better. Let's go back to it. Let me finish here. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet, that's, that's a good word. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised. They didn't arrive yet at that city. Why not? Since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, that's us, be made whole, be made perfect, be made complete. They were looking for something better. All the way through this sermon in Hebrews, the, the preacher has used that word better. He has said that Jesus is better than the angels. He has said that Jesus is better than that priest Melchizedek. You can look that one up. He has said that the hope that Jesus provides is better. Over and over he uses that word better. Can we hear the promise? In your greatest moments of celebration, 
God has something better. In your moments of deepest darkness, God has something better. You want to hear what it is? Well? Yes. Okay. And we're going to read it. I think chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, are a summary of everything that has gone before in the previous 11 chapters. So if you don't get anything else, these are the verses you need to hold on to. Listen to what he says. Therefore, again, if you're reading the Bible, and I hope you are, when you're reading through in your daily devotionals, if you come to that word, therefore, pull out a highlighter because something important is going to happen. What they're doing is saying, because of all of this stuff that I've just been saying to you, there's something that I want you to get. This is the point. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. What he's saying is all those people that he's mentioned, beginning with Abraham and Sarah, and going through all those folks that are listed there in chapter 11, and, and all of the people that you might know yourself that have gone before you, and by faith they have struggled, by faith they've had victories, but all the way through they've been faithful. And they've left an image of, of trust and faithfulness for you. You can probably name people in your own life that are that way. I mean, I, I can name folks that you've never heard of. Uh, people like Frank Parks and, and Clint Anutz. And Y'all don't have any idea who they are, do you? They were teachers for me in, in Sunday school. Sarah Alice King. I mean, I, I can go back to all of these people. Folks, Gene Biedenboe, Rufus Glenn, and Walter Johnson. Y'all don't even want to hear all of them. Have you heard of any of them? Hmm. Some of them maybe. Some of them are preachers. Carrie Ficklin and Clara Edelwein. <laughs> My grandmothers. All of these people have gone before. And now listen to where they are. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Our race is to the city of God. Our race is into the, to the relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And here the writer is using a sports image. Right, get, get this image. We're in this great arena. And all around us, are these folks that have already run the race. They've completed their course in faith. And now they are with the Lord. And they are in this great arena. And what are they doing? They're cheering us on because we're still involved in the race. They're telling us that they have completed the race that Jesus pioneered. Jesus laid the racetrack. And then Jesus perfected. Jesus has finished that course in perfect faithfulness and the course is marked out and they have run that course in the good times and in the bad times and it sounds like they're heroes, right? But they're not. They're just normal folks. If you look back at all those people that are listed, they had their tough times, the times when they weren't particularly faithful. We've already mentioned about the times of Abraham and Sarah, remember? Abraham tried to pass her off as his sister so he could save his bacon. Or he was Jewish, so maybe that's not what he was trying to do. <laughs> I mean, well, I could say, but probably I shouldn't. Save his neck <laughs> by passing her off as his sister so the king wouldn't kill him because the king thought she was great looking and wanted her. So Abraham said, okay, take her. Uh, that doesn't sound very faithful to me. These were normal folks going through difficult struggles in very difficult times as well as in great times of celebration. And they're now gathered around and they're singing, they're shouting for us. They're saying, look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. Look at the suffering He went through, disregarding its shame, and has taken His seat at the right hand of the throne of God. And that is our destiny, is to be there before the throne of God, in the city of God, in perfect relationship, in perfect harmony with God. And He's saying to us, hang in there. Run with perseverance. Y'all remember uh, Forrest Gump? I mean, it's repeated on television every two days. So, if you haven't seen it, y'all have been 
Uh, no, it's been a long time ago. It's one of the, I guess, the second best movie I've ever seen. I won't tell you right now the first one, but we'll, we'll talk about that some other time. But Forrest Gump, remember he had braces on his legs? And he had a bunch of guys chasing him? And he started running? Y'all remember that? What happened to the braces? They fell off. And he ran. And so all the rest of the time you heard the mantra. Run! Run, Forrest, run! That's what they're saying to us. Run the race. Because your destiny is assured because Jesus has already run it and perfected it. Run the race. Hang in there. What's the most difficult book of the Bible to understand? Anybody got a shot at that? Revelation. Oh, everybody says Revelation. Book of Revelation. So hard to understand. You want me to give it to the whole book of Revelation in a single sentence? And you never have to struggle with it again? Hang in there, baby. God wins. <laughs> that is the whole of Revelation. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us. Hang in there. God wins. Run the faith. Run in faith with perseverance. The race that is set before us. Casting aside those things that will hold you back. Those things that hold you down. But keep moving. Keep trusting. Trust God always. Jesus' disciples trust God always. In every circumstance. And in every situation. We don't do it perfectly because we stumble and we fall. All of those folks did. But God will be there to pick us up because Jesus is now running with us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit running alongside of us to pick us up when we think we can't go another step. The older I get, the more I understand this. Some of, we get tired. We get weary. We get worn. And we think, I just cannot put another foot in front of the other. I cannot. And I look at life, and I think life has sometimes kicked me in the teeth. And then I look at these people, and I see them cheering. Hang in there. Persevere. Hold on to the faith. Jesus' disciples, trust God. Always. 